Um, so the the, um, the title of my sort of talk briefing and century called "We Don't Have Any Money, So We're Going to Have to Think." Uh, like a lot of good innovations and ideas, I stole it. The quote was stolen from a scientist called Ernest Rutherford, who was a Kiwi um, nuclear scientist. Um, and the thrust of what I want to talk about is the fact that if you are overfunded in a startup, it can be a very, very dangerous disease. Um, and said more constructively, um, if, you, if you don't have money, or much of it, it's a constraint. And constraints are the cornerstone of creativity. You have to be creative if you're not loaded with cash. So um, normally when I get asked to talk about these sorts of things, I, the conversation with the organizer goes on along the lines of, um, Stuart, can you come and talk a bit about Biobox? And I say, yeah, 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 sure. And knowing full well that I won't do that, I'll, I'll, I'll tell someone else's stories because they're much more interesting. But I won't get away with that stunt today because Frank is very clear that this series has to be practical innovation experience. So it can't be textbook, it can't be theory, it can't be opinion, it has to be things that we have done that we're going to share openly, uh, which I will find difficult actually because partly I'm very, very proud of Biobox and what we're doing. Um, and it's quite difficult to talk about it dispassionately. So please, if it comes across as um, in any way smug or overly confident, can you just park that? It's not meant to be like that. I just don't normally talk about Biobox in this way, so kind of just, uh, just, just bear with me. Um, what I want to do is to tell you two stories about innovation in Biobox and how we have driven the innovation because we didn't have a lot of money, because we were underfunded at the beginning and that's built a DNA and a culture. And in fact, there was something that was said at the um, uh, Silicon Money Comes to Oxford um, last November that really resonated with me, which is that the first sort of 15 recruits in a business will set the DNA of your business forever. And it's very hard to change that. Once you've got that culture set in the business, it's set forever. So I, I want to see two stories that kind of reflect that innovation culture that we have in Biobox. Um, and for them to make any sense, I need to spend about 90 seconds telling you very quickly um, what we set out to do and just rattle through the first four years in literally 90 seconds. And then I'll pause and I'll tell you a story about, about um, some innovation that we did and why it came about. So we started by a box uh, in January 2000 in Silicon Valley, funny enough, made a real mess of things. It was through our own funds. It was me and my business partner with about £200,000 that we had from a previous venture, banked the whole lot into buy a box, completely irresponsibly, completely cavalier. Um, and we managed to spend about £190,000 of that £200,000 in no time flat in Silicon Valley. Most of it on patent applications, actually. Um, and with £10,000 left, we came back to the UK, spent £6,000 of that last £10,000 going to a trade show in Geneva, driving a white van with a bank of lockers um, in, in the back of it, going to Geneva. Um, and there we bumped into somebody that, 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 that pushed our business in a different direction. So what we set out to do was to provide um, a delivery and collection alternative for online shopping. Banks of lockers that would serve as delivery and collection points for consumers that you bought online. So you wouldn't own the lock because you wouldn't use it often enough, you just borrow it for that transaction, you get sent a collection code over a text message, you bang the number into the bank of lockers, door opens and then you stuff. That's the original idea, it didn't work. So we bumped into someone at a trade show back in 2001 that was working for a, uh, as, as it was then, a foot 100 POC called Hayes. It was a conglomerate that did all sorts of different things around logistics and just some people know and then recruitment and so on. And they had a division that was moving spare parts for mobile engineers all over the country into banks of mechanical lockers. They're not electronic, nothing sexy, um, just banks of very big mechanical lockers, about 30 on a, on a location, typically on a, a petrol station or a supermarket, and in the middle of the night, five nights a week, they would deliver spare parts to mobile engineers everywhere from Truro to, to Elgin and Inverness and the most places in between. So the customers were people like Chronic and Minolta, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, Unisys and so on. So um, that to us was a fantastic moment because we could suddenly see that while in our lifetime the consumer market would open up and we could probably use our technology in that space, um, it would take a long time. That on the other hand, this existing market that we could enter and provide some intelligence, some more data through electronics and so on, would hopefully provide um, a really good pond to fishing. So to cut a very long story short, we ended up getting into an agreement with Hayes uh, and to, to rent them 335 banks of electronic lockers for five years. And the contract was worth about £10 million to us. So and just as a quick, as I'm going through this, just bear in mind, at this time in our development, there was a Harvard Business Review case study that was published, it was actually back in 2002, I think. 
And there were 53 companies worldwide trying to do what we were trying to do. 53. Some in the UK, a lot in the US, some in Australia, New Zealand, France, and so on. Every single one of those 53 companies went bust. Every single one. The combined investment was well over $100 million. And every single one of them went bust, apart from Binobox. This is why I don't want this to come out in the wrong way, but I'm just telling you the truth. These are the facts. This is what actually happened. We weren't VC backed, we backed by our own companies <coughs> that, we, that, we, that we, we, we blew in no time flat. Um, so, um, now, so, so we bumped into Hayes at a trade show through networking, which perhaps we'll talk about in another session, um, and came to an agreement to open the lockers. Ten weeks uh, after making the lockers, Hayes announced they're going to break up the group. That was it. They're splitting the group up, and the division that we were renting the lockers to, they said to losing money. It was turning over 6.3 million. And we thought we could make a reasonable fist of making that business make money, delivering spare parts for mobile engineers into lockers. So we basically traded the contract, the commitment, for the business. Yeah. Meanwhile, the, the, we had one main competitor in the UK, a company called Business Direct. And they were doing exactly the same thing as us. It was a carbon copy, electronic lockers for the mobile engineering. It's called field support, supporting field engineers. Um, and also, at some point, to use the same locker technology for internet shopping. They were a carbon copy of Bylox. Apart from that, all of their lockers were electronic. We had a, a similar network size, 300 electronic locker banks each, but we had thousands of mechanical lockers as well, as a result of the acquisition that we made through Hayes. Now, the big difference is, and this is where you'll start to see, this is kind of, that's, that's the kind of gallop through the first four years. The big difference is that Business Direct has 7 million quid. So they are listed on the AIM market, and they have £7 million of funding, a very professional team. Um, I'm trying to find a plot of sense because I'm being video, so I need to be slightly careful. We absolutely <laughs> hated each other. We wanted to knock seven bells out of each other. Um, and in my mind, it was a fight of good over evil. Um, they, they tried all sorts of nasty tricks. Um, they were extremely well funded. Um, and we were a business in their mind that had this dumb locker network with an aspiration to have electronics and so on and so on. So, the first thing I want to tell you is what happened the week that we launched our transport network after having bought this division from Hayes. So there they were, acquired this division that was what swapped it, um, turning over 6.3 million, and we could not afford to lose a single one of our top 20 customers. If we lost any, any of them, it would absolutely would, would, we would have gone bust. And over here is Business Direct, whose stated mission from their CEO to me in person was that we basically are going to nick all your customers. We're going to roll out our electronic locker network and we're going to steal all your customers. And he had the temerity to say to me in Oxford at dinner, in all seriousness, this isn't a joke by the way, he said, um, we're going to nick all your customers anyway, but I'll tell you what we could do. If you give us half your customers, we'll leave you alone. <laughs> and he said, your, your children will be okay, my children will be okay, just give us what well, I declined this kind of to give away half our customer base. Um, and in the first week of, of acquiring this division, six of our top ten customers went to tender. I was absolutely <laughs> gutted. And at the time, our biggest customer, it's not to their biggest customer, to junior partner, but at the time, our biggest customer was Dixon's Group. And we were delivering the spare parts for the warranty engine. So if you bought a PC at Dixon's and a hard drive went ping, um, we would do the replacement hard drive to an engineer and you would go and fix it in your, in your PC. So they went out to tender uh, and they were so fed up with the underinvestment that Hayes had put into this business. So, um, as any of us would do, I went, I went begging to the guy that was running the, this, this warranty division at Dixon to say, what, what is it that I can do to stop you leaving us? Because you're our biggest customer and I just, you know, it will break my heart if this happens because it will probably break the business. Um, <coughs> so, what, what can we do to try and stop you leaving? And, um, he basically said, well, you need to try and help us get all of the return parts back through your network. Because at the moment, we send those parts out through you, and virtually none of them come back. They should all come back, either as broken parts that have been swapped out, or unused parts that go through the network again. Okay. So, but I don't want any fancy labelling nonsense, because the engineers will lose, if you give them additional labels to return things back, they'll lose them, and so on. So, okay. So, we're going through the tender process. And these rascals of Business Direct are obviously chuckling to themselves, thinking we're about to nick your biggest customer. And they were, actually. They were, this, wasn't, this wasn't a joke. They really were about to nick our biggest customer, among some others. Um, and that, um, we didn't have any money to try and you know, throw at this particular problem, so we had to give it some, some thought. And we came up with this thing, which will sound very underwhelming to you, but it's basically, if you imagine a, a, a box with a parcel in it, a, a hard disk or a memory card, a video card, it's in a cardboard box, and it's got one of our distribution labels on it with a barcode on it, and we'll get it through to the engineer's box. 
And we came up with this very simple thing, which is just a black stripe that the engineer puts over the outbound box to send it back again, and it had a two-dimensional barcode embedded in the black stripe that would turn it from a delivery to a return. Same tracking number goes out, we can measure has it come back yet or not within two or three days, because the engineer should be sending it back like clockwork. So within the space of about, so we launched this with, with, um, with Dixon's, we kept the account, within about four weeks we'd got the returns well over 90%, and this guy suddenly became you know, a big fan. That black stripe product today is responsible for about 12 million pounds of our income. We turn out 51 million pounds today. And that one innovation, very much as long as it's eight years ago now, it's a long time ago. Um, and that led us on a journey to realize that in our sector, in that particular sector, most people focus on transport. They focus on distributing spare parts to engineers. We started to realize that actually the mantra needs to be move the data, not the path. Stop basing on transport. So if I roll forward a couple of years now, um, we subsequently won Business Direct's biggest customer, which was Fujitsu. I mean, not, not only won them in the UK, we, we, we won Fujitsu in five countries. So that was a, was a sort of a wonderful moment, albeit it almost bust us because it was such a, a lot of work to do. Um, so, and, and interestingly, we also um, won a contract with Computer Centre about two years ago. And we beat UPS. Now, little old buy box. I'm proud of our turnover, but we're small compared to UPS. Why did we beat UPS in in, in the final analysis with Computer Centre. And the feedback from Computer Centre was, UPS is a transport company. Biobox is a technology company that happens to have a transport network. So, um, th so that's kind of the end of the first story. And the big, the big lesson for me in all of that is that big, when you think back on that, despite the fact we absolutely hate each other, to take the emotion out of that between us and Business Direct, they had seven million quid of funding and a business plan. So they went about rolling out their business plan. We didn't have seven million quid, and we were on a race to find out what customer problems can we solve that we will get paid for, because we didn't have the beauty of loads of cash. And what I realised is I thought more and more about this, and actually the reason I want to understand this is because at some point I want to do another startup, um, and, I, and it often worries me. I think, well, I don't really know how this one was successful, so unless I try and work out why we've managed to get this <laughs> off the ground, I know that maybe another one work. And I think one of the key things is, if you have loads of funding, then you almost are seduced into assuming that you are right. If you have no funding, you cannot afford to be wrong. And there's a massive difference between those two states of mind. And so if you have loads of, if you've got seven million quid, one thing you will definitely do is spend it. And you will spend it almost, when you think about it, arrogantly assuming that your business plan is right. And you will just roll it out and you will assume if we roll out these electronic lockers, we can nick all of Biobox's customers. Wrong. Okay. We couldn't assume that. We had to find out what things can we do for our customers that they will pay us for. So that was kind of the end of the first story. The second story um, is uh, it actually relates to the original idea for the business, which was you know, delivering online shopping for consumers. So um, she doesn't know how to do this actually, but um, can you just make yourself known? So this is Indy Vitale, she works for Biobox. Um, about three. <laughs> Uh, I know she still works well, but I can't finish the story actually. But, uh, so, um, about three years ago, uh, India had been running the marketing for all of our um, business, that would sort of B2B e business, um, for probably about three years, I think it probably was, two or three, something like that, yeah. Um, and about three years ago, came to me and said, You know that original idea about um, delivering uh, online shopping into electronic lockers, so you don't have to wait at home, you can do it at night, it's very carbon friendly, and all the other great reasons. Um, why don't we have a crack at that now? We've got a transport network, we do about 20 million things a year for very demanding you know, uh, business customers. We've got a transport network, we've got thousands of lockers, and we've got a software team to die for. We don't need anything else. Just go to online retailers and say to them, do you want to offer this? Delivery for online shopping today is, is, is rubbish. You know, you, delivering to us when we're not at home is just madness. So why don't we go to them with that kind of proposition? So, um, so Indy, um, moved from one of the marketing, we replaced Indy with someone else to do marketing, and she championed this consumer proposition on her own for three years, or up until today, she's still doing it. Um, so, anyway, so the, the story that I want to tell you briefly is, um, is, is one of the lessons that we learned, uh, again, it's all about the kind of, we don't have any money, so we're going to have to think, in how we launched and finally made a breakthrough, finally made an important breakthrough in this online shopping delivery um, piece that, that, that we tried to um, be pursuing for a while now. And it, it goes back a couple of years um, where we, uh, at one point we've had this work, we, we designed a solution where you can use 
a buy box locker for all of your online shopping. It's called My Buy Box. So we designed it, we did the software development, the, the operational integration, uh, the website, and, and it works. You can go on to My Buy Box and register. So any of you that are a startup will know you have that wonderful feeling when you when you solve something. You think, well, that's it. I've, I've built it, I've designed it, I've launched it. It's done. Great. Now I've got to tell everyone about it. That's the really difficult bit. Or marketing. I'm not a marketer, but I'm a software developer by, by trade. So, um, and so the. Um, the problem for us was that at this point, our kids had probably turned over about 30 million quid. We were probably making about 2 million in profit um, and investing all of it in growth, all of it either buying other small companies or, or launching B2B in new territories. So we, our budget, I think, for the first year for consumer was about £50,000 in marketing. Anyone that knows anything about marketing will know you can't really build a national consumer brand with £50,000. Um, so it didn't stop us having a go. Uh, the first thing that we did was to pick one of our locations, well, in fact, they've got a bank of lockers, it was on a Morrison site in Cardiff. And we paid someone to drop leaflets to the local houses to basically say, um, oh, do you get carded saying, sorry we missed you, you know, by raw mail and passports and the edge of the world? Does it really annoy you? And if it does, go to mybuybox.com and register. Your local site is like a mile away in a Morrison's. Seven, is it, is it seven thousand pounds or seven thousand leaflets? I can't think of the number of record. We got three customers. <laughs> three. I might even be talking about maybe it was two, but anyway, it was really, really, really <laughs> super impressive. So, so we then, um, just before Christmas that year, we launched this thing with network routes, put lockers for consumer dealers on railway stations. Fantastic. A three year journey for India single handedly getting us into network rail. Brilliant. So, I, 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 I haven't had experience as painful as this. Standing on Victoria Station, there's a locker bank over here, and all these people, tens of thousands, streaming past you, and in the whites of their eyes, you can see you're going to miss a delivery today, aren't you? Because you're in London, you're not at home, and DHL and Royal Mail, all those other cretins are going to deliver to your house, and you're not there. The solution's over there. How can I tell you all you It's so simple. Madness. So, what do you do? Leave it, leave it. We couldn't afford the razzle dazzle of a, a, a national TV campaign, and so we had to just try more of a sort of terrorist approach. That, I think actually, did we get 20 customers? It was really even so, you were about to laugh, it was awful. Um, so, that Christmas, chins on boots. Oh, and by the way, I want to explain that the, um, at this point, we're now kind of 10 years into the Bible story. Um, at this point, I was completely convinced that delivery to a locker should be a premium price because it's next day, it's pre-8 in the morning, it's a really efficient service, and you don't get it whenever you like. It's great. You should pay a premium for that. And I was literally the last man on the hill shouting at everyone in buy box that it should be a premium price. Eventually, uh, after sort of some smacking around, I said, no, actually, do you know what? Over this particular Christmas, which was about two years ago, we came to the realisation, actually, we all hate paying for delivery. We hate it. I bought the shirt, I've got to pay to transport it, I bought the wine, it's really irritating. So, petulantly, I swam completely the other way, and this is a great segue into Tony's talk to me, actually. So I said, do you know what, if you, if you like, won't pay a premium for my wonderful service, have it for free. Do that then, have it for free. So, we then had a set up this strategy of saying, if you read the TV news in online retailing at the moment, consumers hate paying for delivery. And it's a ridiculous situation. They want, we want, um, a better delivery service. I want it tomorrow. I don't want to have to wait at home, thanks very much, and I want it for free. Wow, that's amazing. You want a much better service for nothing. And the online retailers realise we all hate paying for transport, so they will provide you with a free delivery option. Almost every online retailer has a free delivery option. Is it any good? No, it's crap. It's two to three days. If you wanted to wait at home for your lunch, you've got no idea what's actually going to turn up. So we thought, and I'm talking about getting into indie thought, why don't we go to um, an online retailer that isn't offering free delivery, whose competitors are offering free delivery, and that doesn't have any high street shops to do a cheap click and collect service, and go to them and say, we will do delivery for free. Not going to work forever, it's not sustainable, as the will do it. We'll do it for free. On the understanding that we can just, after the consumer, if they, if they use it, this wonderful service, all in there, don't wait till text tomorrow, um, we can send them a marketing email to say, if you enjoyed using Buybox for this online shopping experience, go to mybuybox.com and register and use it for everything and pay us directly. So that was the sort of idea. Um, and to cut the next bit short, this is, this is interesting actually. Um, the first retailer that we integrated with was Fig Leaves, the online laundry retailer, figleaves.com, and that was about a year and a half ago. 
And to my utter astonishment, today we've probably done about 50,000 deliveries now for fig leaves. So when we tried integrating it with another retailer, SHU, S-C-H-U-A-SHU.co.uk, when I was still believing it was a premium service, we integrated with SHU, charging five quid as a premium for it. Literally, we delivered one pair of shoes in six months. Unbelievable. We offer it for free with fig leaves, um, and today, yes, yeah, about 50,000 deliveries. Interestingly, and we've talked with other retailers now as well, the, the current conversion from one of the more recent retailers, so, so because of the asset test for us is, um, we can do that for free, we can deliver hot pants for free to lockers, we're going there anyway, it's not going to cost us very much, so you know, we don't have any money, we can't spend money on a massive campaign, but we can deliver some stuff for free to a point. The critical thing is, what's the conversion rate? How many people are actually converted to paying my Bible's customers? One of the retailers that we launched with in January, the current conversion to paying customers is 17%. Fantastic. So the cost of acquisition in the traditional world, seven grand, two customers, three and a half grand to acquire them, madness. The cost to us today of acquisition is probably running at about six pounds. We can afford that. It's not even cash cost to us. It's, it's delivering for free. So um, I think wrapping all of that up, the, uh, I am a real believer in being overfunded as a disease. Um, uh, when if you're underfunded, you do genuinely have to think. And the last thing I want to say uh, before I hand over to Tony is um, that kind of, I've told two stories, uh, very specific examples, because um, as Uncle Frank told me about asking for an example, so I, ho I hope that I've sort of fulfilled the objective. Um, but um, the, 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 the innovation culture that Frank referred to at the beginning, it really is that, you know, if you are underfunded and you are forced to create, and innovation really is the commercial application of creativity, if it, it absolutely infuses your entire culture, the DNA of the business. So, and I'll give you just one, it's probably the most powerful thing that we've experienced in the Biobox, the, the manifestation of this. If you've got loads of money, the chances are you will employ people that are very well educated, that are very professional, very corporate, and so on and so on. If you don't have loads of money, you can't afford those people. You have to rec recruit people who are pirates, rebels, terrorists, insecure, chip on your shoulder, I'm out to prove something. And the very best people in our business are people like Indy, you know all those things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the, the joined us, you know, with a twinkle in their eye, to, to see, do you know what, this is a journey, and I can prove a lot for myself, for you, going on that journey. And I think that is the one thing that I've really learned. If you get those sorts of people together, and I know in a future session with Francis talking about that, you get the right kind of people together, uh, and through collaboration, which is another one of Tony's topics, um, great things can happen. Thanks very much.